This is a video about a man accused of crimes he did not commit, and what the consequences of those accusations can be. This is not a video about Starfield, but Starfield does play a role, and Starfield does matter to many people. Now, I think that everyone should be able to express whatever opinion they have about a game, and that people holding and expressing different opinions is a good thing. In fact, I would like to believe that in many ways my entire channel champions this idea. And so, if you hate Starfield, I think that's okay. And if you want to express your hatred of Starfield online, I also think that's okay. And if you are disappointed in Starfield, Bethesda, or any other part of the gaming industry, then I think that's okay as well. But there are things which are not okay no matter what your opinion of a game might be. And it's those things that I want to focus on. So, this video is not like my normal content. I will not be criticizing a game, but I will be talking about games criticism, and about some of the things that people don't usually talk about, but maybe should. Finally, this is not a video that I wanted to make, but it is a video that needed to be made. Today, we are going to talk about game development, game analysis, YouTube, the internet, lies, how information spreads, how stories evolve, human nature, justice, and other things. And there will be other things. But if there is one single part of this video that I would like people to walk away with, it is the importance of fact-checking. To this end, I would like to invite anyone who wants to fact check what I'm about to say to do so. To make this as easy as possible for you, I've included a list of all sources in the description, alongside relevant timestamps for videos I reference that I will do my best to order chronologically according to when they're referenced. As someone who has spent the last week scrubbing through numerous videos, some of which are quite long, hopefully this will make the job that I have spent so long doing recently easier for you. You're welcome. With that out of the way, let's begin with the most infamous speech in the history of game development. This story is as much about the journey as the destination, and so I think the best way to tell it is to take you along the path that I took to get here. Now, hopefully, if you're watching this, you are at least somewhat familiar with Starfield and its developer, Bethesda. But if not, the short version is that Bethesda are the makers of several popular RPGs, and their latest game, Starfield, left many people disappointed. Something else you might be familiar with is me. And if you are, you might know that the last video I made was about bad games and how people react and talk about them. It was during the making of that video that I ended up noticing how discussions around Starfield were increasingly becoming centered on one single name. Emil Pagliarulo, a man thousands of people seemed to hate. So pathetic. I swear to God, some game developers, there's like this, this fucking uh, strain of game developers. Now, I'm not exactly new to video game discussions, and so this name was familiar to me. Emil is a design director at Bethesda Game Studios, who worked as a writer on Oblivion before becoming the lead writer on Fallout 3, Skyrim, Fallout 4, and most recently, Starfield. The reason I already knew of Emil is because he's long been mentioned by some people in the Bethesda fan community as an almost boogeyman type figure who is responsible for many of the bad parts of these games. Something I was never sure of, however, was when and how this animosity between Emil and the Fallout and Elder Scrolls community started. And so, as I saw him being mercilessly ripped into on Twitter, in YouTube thumbnails, in big YouTube videos, and even in the gaming media, I became curious about where this conflict began and what exactly Emil's original crimes were. The earliest anti-Emil remarks that are still around come from the old-school Fallout forum No Mutants Allowed, a place once known for its users' passionate dislike of Fallout 3 and Bethesda. For some background, Fallout 1 and 2 were developed by different studios, and after Bethesda acquired the Fallout license, 
Many older Fallout fans were concerned about the direction the series would take, and things like the move away from an isometric perspective. No Mutants Allowed was originally the place for these types of concerns to be voiced, but initially, Emil's reputation there was pretty positive. This seems to be because he was one of the only Bethesda developers who actually addressed older fans' concerns during Fallout 3's development. People didn't always like the answers he gave, but they seemed to appreciate him. Quote, It's still pretty awesome that a prominent Bethesda dev finally walks out of his shell to answer questions. Or, now seriously, those answers aren't bad, at least this guy actually makes sense when he talks. Or, it's rather weird, but I like that interview because for once he was not trying to sell how awesome Fallout 3 was, he was being honest, and even if reality sucks, it's better than a lie. Emil's reputation would change after the release of Fallout 3, and then it got worse with time as Fallout 3's success became clear and it started winning Game of the Year awards and such. During this time, Emil, as lead writer and designer on the game, did a lot of interviews and publicity events talking about the game's reception and planned DLC, which brought plenty of continued attention. This situation was likely exacerbated by the fact that Bethesda, Emil, and particularly the games media all seemed to be acting like Fallout 3 was a great game, with interviews and awards that were celebratory in nature, all while No Mutants Allowed considered Fallout 3 to be a relatively bad game and something of a betrayal of the series, with the writing in particular being scrutinised for inconsistencies with the original lore, as well as problems with Fallout 3's ending. This made Emil one of the main faces of fan discontent, and it was a discontent that wasn't being acknowledged by anyone outside of the forum, perhaps making it more extreme. And yet, in the grand scheme of things, this all seems pretty insignificant. Make no mistake, this was where Emil's negative online reputation began, but as soon as he stopped doing interviews following Fallout 3's release, search results for his name on No Mutants Allowed became relatively rare, and outside of No Mutants Allowed, there is almost no negativity attached to his name in this period at all. For example, on Reddit, from all results before 2015, there is just one person I can find that is unhappy with Emil, and while they are very unhappy, the issue they're angry about is not being allowed to kill children in Fallout 3, which they hold Emil personally responsible for. This user has since deleted their post, and whatever their real issue was, it seems unrelated and slightly concerning. No one should be that angry about not getting to kill children. Anyway, in 2015, the Fallout Bethesda discourse would be jump-started once more by the release of the next mainline entry, Fallout 4, a game that received a more mixed reception from fans, with many people being critical of its story and or writing. And yet, that criticism is still largely disconnected from Emil's name. There are some exceptions, of course, but they're still relatively rare. And yet, if you skip forward two years, this changes completely, with negative comments about Emil now showing up all the time and being very specific, with a lot of the criticism based on actual quotes or Emil's writing philosophy. The event which caused this change is a single speech given at Copenhagen Games Festival 2016. A small event with a small crowd where Emil was invited to deliver a talk on storytelling in games. This speech is going to be referenced many, many, many times by myself and even more so from other people who will appear in this video. So, that means you are going to see multiple different interpretations of this speech. But before that, why not listen to some of the most referenced and important parts of this without further commentary, so you can form your own opinion. And remember, the full version is below if you want to see more, and if this section feels a little long, well, trust me that it will be important. How do we make our stories, and how do I personally make my stories? Um, I thought, you know, it's funny, I, I had never really thought of the process that I use to write stories and make games, and then I realized I do have a process. Um, and I started to put it together, I realized that there are three primary points that I use when I create a story for one of our games. So I thought I'd run through those three points um, for everyone here today. So, going to the first point, kiss, keep it simple, stupid, what does that mean? Well, for me, that means 
When I'm coming up with a story for a game, I like to concentrate on strong central themes. And one or two strong central themes is enough. Now going to the second point, write what you know. What does this mean, write what you know? Does this mean that if you are working as a dishwasher and decide to become a game developer, you need to make a game about washing dishes? No. Write what you know, for me, means that you draw upon your personal experiences. So for me, um, one of my biggest, uh, my first big break at Bethesda was uh, around 2006, when we started working on Oblivion, I was tasked with creating the Dark Brotherhood, which is the Assassin's Guild. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of leverage the experience I had um, at, at Looking Glass Studios working on the Thief games. Um, and Thief is about sneaking around and, and, you know, and stealing stuff. I want to sneak around and stab people in the face. Um, I thought that would be fun. I thought to myself, how could I relate this, you know, an evil assassin's guild, to my own personal experiences? It's like, I don't know what this is, but, but I do know. I know the Catholic Church. I grew up Catholic. And so, actually, the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion, the story is actually an evil take on the Catholic Church. Now, my third point, the longest point, and all of these sort of tie together, but great games are played and not made. So this is a, this is a point for the studio. This is one of our mottos at the studio. But it has several meanings. Um, on a studio-wide level, great games are played, not made, means that we use the iterative process. We make the game. We are very flexible with changing things. We are actually at a state now um, in, in the development of the studio, we don't have a lot of extensive design documentation. We found that probably after we hit Fallout 3, the design docs that we had became outdated very quickly because we knew we needed to get stuff in the game and play it and then change it. We needed to iterate on it. So we would have these extensive 50-page design documents that were completely outdated, and the time it took to maintain those just wasn't worth it. And so great games are played, not made, means that as a studio, um, you know, we are constantly iterating. But also, on a personal level, and so on a personal level, on a designer level, that's what it means. Great games are played, not made. It means play your own stuff. But as a writer, so, let's, so how, do we, how do we look at this with stories, right? Great games are played, not made. Played, that's the key word, right? Because every game developer is a storyteller in an interactive medium. Um, you are not writing a screenplay. You are not writing a novel. You are writing a piece of fiction that has um, an important interactive component. When we start writing a story at Bethesda, when I start working with the team, we start big. Like, you know, we always want to do this. So we always want to write the great American novel, right? So let's say, okay, we're going to write the great American novel. It's going to be this thing. And on every page will be written comedy and tragedy, and it'll be wonderful. It'll be amazing. And you're going to give this book, this great American novel, to the player. And what are they going to do with it? They're going to rip out every page and make paper airplanes out of them. And they're going to throw them around the room. And they're never going to see your story. Because the story is there, right? But they are going to spend 30 hours making shacks. Okay? They're going to spend 20 hours looking for bobbleheads. Okay? But that's okay. We know that going in. That's, that's the, the jagged pill that we swallow when we do this. Um, because again, great games are played, not made, and a story in a video game is an interactive thing. Um, and so we know that and we're comfortable with that. Because the true mark of being a, a, tr a, of a real developer is, as every developer knows, is waiting for reviews to come in, right? And then reading the reviews, of course, and hopefully, if you get lucky, ignoring the reviews, right? Thank you very much, guys. So, what did you think? As this will be referenced continuously from here on out, I will do a quick summary that I think is in good faith and is completely factual. 
When Emil was asked to give this speech, he thought about his writing process and came up with three rules he finds useful. Keep it simple stupid, which he explains as being about having a single, strong, central theme in a story. Write what you know, which he explains as drawing from personal experience in your writing, where he gives an example of working on the Thief series and growing up Catholic when designing the Dark Brotherhood. And lastly, great games are played, not made, a company-wide motto at Bethesda about the importance of iteration and playtesting when creating games. Emil then also says he applies this as a writer by making sure to remember that you are writing for an interactive medium, which is different to non-interactive mediums. He gives a light-hearted analogy of just because writers want to write the next great American novel doesn't mean players will comply and might instead make paper aeroplanes out of the pages by just doing whatever they feel like. Therefore, don't forget about player freedom when writing. Of course, there are many other things said in this speech. It is over 40 minutes long. A lot of it is about Fallout 4, or providing other examples of these three rules. In my summary, I focused on the rules rather than Fallout 4, because these days the negativity focuses on Emil himself more than Fallout 4. As for that negativity, we'll get to it soon. And I am sorry for this slow introduction, but you'll soon see why it's necessary. Anyway, now that you've heard the most infamous speech in the entire history of game development, what did you think? From the evidence you have seen, does this man need to be fired? And should fans and YouTubers feel justified in harassing and hating him? Don't worry if you don't have an answer quite yet. There are many more arguments to come and more evidence. But as we hear those arguments, keep in mind the context of this speech. This was a fairly informal affair at a very small event. The speech might even have been hastily written. But these sorts of events are good for the industry because they help smaller game devs, particularly when it comes to networking, and having a bigger name speaker helps attract people to them. Emil is also not a professional public speaker, he is a game developer, so this is not something he has much experience in, and many people find public speaking difficult. So why am I here in Copenhagen? I don't do this, I don't speak, I prefer to stay in my office and make games. He was also probably nervous. I mean, that is the very first thing he says. I'm a bundle of nervous energy, so I'll try to use that. Uh... This speech had an enormous impact. This is what turned the world against Emil. This was what caused negative comments about Emil to go from there but rare to being everywhere. But that didn't happen right away. In fact, when this was first uploaded and then posted to our Fallout, the response was mild, with 165 upvotes and 172 comments. As for those comments, they were mixed. Let's go through some, starting at the top. The first is about Hayao Miyazaki's face. The next is a summary. The next is positive about Emil's rules and negative about how they applied to Fallout 4. The next is also negative about Fallout 4, and so is the next. The next is deleted. The next is speculating that this will start a shit show. The next is actually negative about Emil's rules, at least to keep it simple stupid. The next says Far Harbor, which is Fallout 4's DLC, was better than the base game. The next is someone laughing and saying that this is the fuel many on the subreddit were waiting for, and so on. Overall, it's a mix of responses, but most of the negativity is still placed on Fallout 4 rather than Emil himself, and no one seems to think this speech is that shocking. And maybe that lines up with your own thoughts about the speech. And so, this speech the most infamous speech in the entire history of game development had no real impact. Until one year later, when Reddit user, a flying nun, made a post titled, Until Bethesda fires slash relocates Emil Pagliarillo, do not expect quality storylines ever again. Yes, it is that bad. And at last, after all this boring introduction that I will try to edit down and shorten as much as I can, but I can't work miracles, at last, the introduction is over and we have made it to the start. 
of the unhinged. In an ideal world, you would have watched the entirety of Emil's speech, and then you would take the time to read the entirety of this Reddit post. Because I don't think there is anything I can say that will accurately communicate just what a drastically uncharitable and inaccurate representation of Emil's speech this post is. Still, the world is not ideal, and so I will do my best. Also, not to spoil a big chunk of this video for you, but this right here demonstrates clearly the main problem that is at the heart of this story. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. A Flying Nun's post begins by saying he recently came across Emil's speech and wanted to speak up about it because he didn't think anyone had broken down just how bad it is and how it speaks volumes about how unqualified Emil is. He breaks his long assessment down into four main problems. The first is, and I quote, for the entirety of this video, Emil seems to follow this pattern. Step 1. Emil makes a claim that a new feature, major change, or cut content was necessary for development. Step 2. You rationally ask yourself why, as he hasn't said why yet. Step 3. Emil goes off on a pointless tangent for a bit. Step 4. Emil begins making a very good counter-argument against his own argument and his own initial claim, highlighting serious flaws with it. Step 5. Emil moves on to the next subject. Step 6. You throw your keyboard through your computer monitor in a fit of rage with how retarded that just was. End quote. So, as far as I can see, this six-step model is not something Emil does even once, let alone enough to constitute a pattern. I think the reason for a flying nun's confusion might be because that he is an unhappy Fallout 4 fan that is watching this speech to get explanations for why design decisions in Fallout 4 that he doesn't like were made. Meanwhile, Emil isn't trying to give a speech justifying these decisions and is instead just talking about his personal design process to try to provide useful information to other game developers, i.e. the actual audience, and he is just using Fallout 4 as an example for this. He does admittedly talk about problems Bethesda faced with various design choices in the game, but Emil isn't the only developer who has done this. In fact, it's quite a common thing for developers to mention problems they've faced during development in speeches, and the GDC YouTube channel features hundreds of examples. Also, Emil usually does say why these decisions were made. To counter a flying nun's lead example of not justifying the new dialogue system, Emil says the reason for the change was that they felt the old system was dated, they were inspired by games like Mass Effect and Telltale's The Walking Dead, and they wanted to create a more fluid interaction during dialogue between the player and their character. Now, I'm not saying this was especially well explained by Emil, and for what it matters, I also wasn't a fan of this particular change. But Emil is not speaking nonsense or doing anything unusual, and there is nothing accurate about this borderline incoherent way he's being characterized throughout this whole Reddit post. Moving on, a flying nun's second main problem is that Emil, quote, sometimes goes off onto pointless topics. You know, this sounds a lot like the first main problem, step three. Is there a significant difference between a pointless tangent and a pointless topic? If so, I couldn't explain it, but a flying nun's lead example for this is that Emil, quote, awkwardly shows pictures of his co-workers in the middle of a speech for no discernible reason. And, well, the reason he talks about and shows pictures of his co-workers is because he's talking about his team's work. This is what Emil says. But they're great, and I work with this team to create our stories. When we start writing a story at Bethesda, when I start working with the team... The reason a flying nun says this is pointless is because it's something he doesn't care about. It serves no point for what he wants to know, but all Emil is trying to do here is acknowledge the other people involved in the work that he's actively talking about, so as not to erase his team's contributions in his explanation. That's why he keeps saying we rather than I. He's talking about his team, that's why he showed his team. This isn't rocket science. 
Moving on, the third major problem that is apparently the biggest is Emil's own lack of analytical skills in regards to writing. Now, a flying nun, if you're listening to this, I don't want to be mean. But I'm not sure you are the right person to criticize someone else's lack of analytical skills. Anyway, here a flying nun says Emil cannot differentiate between concepts and things. And the evidence he presents for this is that when Emil talks about themes in movies and other games, he focuses on concepts. And yet apparently when Emil talks about his own work, he focuses on things and concepts, therefore Emil can't differentiate between the two, which a flying nun describes as a serious problem for a writer. Now, would you like to see what Emil actually said in a flying nun's example? You know, Skyrim. Skyrim is a game about dragons, right? Even in the studio. What is the game about? It's about dragons. But the story is not really about dragons, right? It is about the lone hero, right? The, the, it actually, it is, it is much more biblical than any, a lot of the other stories we've done. It's about the, the dragonborn, the Dovahkiin, is much more of a messiah sort of character. So this is what proves Emil can't differentiate between things and concepts, and therefore lacks analytical skills. Even more suspect than this though, is what a flying nun says about Fallout 4's main concept, suspicion. Quote, Of all emotions and feelings, I dare say Emil somehow found the most infantile. Like, really, I'm asking seriously, can someone think of a less interesting human emotion or feeling than suspicion? Even Lust spawns dozens of trashy romance novels. End quote. Okay, so apparently, suspicion is the designated child emotion, unlike all the other adult emotions that we are allowed to feature in stories. Yep, that's right. Blade Runner, The Thing, almost every Hitchcock movie. Yeah, you guessed it. They must all be trashy kiddie movies because they focus on suspicion, the quote, most infantile emotion. Also, why is Lust added as the, I guess, second least interesting? You don't think Lust is an interesting emotion? Oh, fuck. They're a child, aren't they? I am bullying a child on the internet. God damn it. And I usually try hard not to do things like that. Oh well, this was over seven years ago. I'm sure they've grown up. I do think I need to say here, though, that if anyone who watches this video goes on to harass any of the people that I am going to talk about, in my name or otherwise, I will ban you. Don't ask how I will know, don't ask whether that is a feature on YouTube, it is. I am making this video in large part because of my dislike for harassment and dogpiling. Do not be part of the problem. Also, I would like to say in a flying nun's defense, he wrote something pretty dumb, but thousands and thousands of other people saw this and took it as fact. They saw someone saying, Emil is a bad writer that needs to be fired because he wrote about suspicion and suspicion is the most infantile emotion. And they thought, yeah, that makes sense to me. So who exactly is the dumbest in this situation, I ask? Moving on to the final problem, which is apparently that Emil correctly identifies literary concepts. Hey, good job, Emil but then blatantly violates them. Stop! You violated the law! The example a flying nun gives is Emil's use of write what you know, which he says is wrong because apparently Emil focuses on acts. For example, stabbing people rather than experiences. This is referring to the Dark Brotherhood section. He then switches to praising people who do apparently know how to do this, like Chris Avalone, who apparently writes about things that depress him, and Josh Sawyer, who writes about history. These two were both lead designers on Fallout New Vegas, which likely explains this entire post. If you don't know, there is, and certainly was, a lot of tribalism in the Fallout community, usually not between old fans and new fans, because old fans are old by this point, but instead between fans of Obsidian Entertainment's Fallout New Vegas and fans of Bethesda's Fallout 3 and 4. A flying nun is clearly a New Vegas fan who dislikes Emil because he is a Bethesda developer. So there you go, that's the motive here. He 
does say that he wants to hug Chris Avalone, so that's nice. I think. And then he attacks Emil for creating the acronym KISS. Keep it simple stupid. Not realizing that Emil is not actually the inventor of KISS, which was a design principle that has apparently been around since the 60s and was coined by an engineer in the US Navy. The post concludes by saying, In short, the entire video depicts Emil as someone incapable of collecting his thoughts, incapable of analytical thinking skills, incapable of withholding thoughts in his mind for longer than 10 seconds, and even incapable of justifying his own decisions. And no, the video does not depict any of those things. But that is how this Reddit post depicts Emil. And this post was influential. With over 8,000 upvotes and more than a thousand comments, this alone makes it one of the top posts in the r Fallout subreddit. But it wasn't only posted to r Fallout, and that wasn't the only place it was well received. For example, it also got 6,000 upvotes and 1.2 thousand comments on r PC Gaming, and it made its way to plenty of other subreddits as well, eventually. Now, I do have to wonder, as someone who doesn't really use Reddit much, can Redditors read? That's it, that's the question. Can Redditors read? I mean, has anyone ever checked? Obviously, don't write the question down for them, that might confuse them, but have we considered some kind of other way to conduct a poll to understand what we're dealing with here and how something like this goes so unchallenged for so long? I'm sorry, I might be getting a little carried away there, and I don't want to insult anyone either. In reality, it's not actually that hard to see how this post was successful. The entire thing is written in a very authoritative style. A flying nun talks with complete confidence and presents himself as an expert on the subject at hand. He uses lots of examples to back his points up, and he invokes literary terms like Chekhov's gun, as well as the names of other developers to show off his understanding of the industry and writing. And so, it's actually quite easy to imagine how people might be taken in by this post, particularly if they only skim through it, which people often do when presented with such a big wall of text, and especially if they've never seen the original speech being referenced to compare the two, and realize how drastically inaccurate this post is. And as for Emil's speech, it's not great. He does seem a bit awkward and nervous, his examples are sometimes quite shallow. There are a few points where he does go off on tangents. They're not pointless, but it's not always immediately apparent to the viewer what the point is. And really, there are lots of things you could criticize about this speech. It's not great. But it's not especially bad either. I have seen plenty of worse public speakers. And don't forget the context. A small speech at a small event from one game developer to some others. The crowd, for what it's worth, seem to have liked the speech. They laugh at Emil's jokes. Well, of course, when I think of Danish gaming, chili con carne, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And they give him a warm applause at the end. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Of course, there's a chance they were just being polite, we don't truly know, but we can tell they had a very different response to the one a flying nun had. I mean, no one in the audience flies into any fits of rage, for one thing. And as for the audience of the Reddit post, a lot of people didn't seem to agree with it. The top post points out how Emil was not the inventor of Kiss, the second from the top does agree with a flying nun and says OP is only scratching the surface, to which a flying nun gives an enthusiastic reply to. But after that, there's plenty of disagreement. Quote, OP is going a bit nuts with the criticism. Emil did not invent Kiss, lay off the chems for a while, dude. Or imagining OP's bedroom walls covered in hand-drawn spirals. Or I'm glad I'm not visible enough for someone to psychologically evaluate my entire capability and competency at my job on a single presentation I gave at a random event. Or, I have similar concerns about Bethesda's storytelling, 
but am I the only one uncomfortable with going after one person with this kind of intensity? And so on. There was pushback. It just didn't matter. And soon, this post would go beyond Reddit. February 2017, two weeks after the Reddit post, YouTuber It's a Gundam posted a video titled Until Bethesda fires or relocates Emil Pagliarello, do not expect quality storylines ever again. Huh, that's a strikingly familiar sentence. The video opens with two YouTubers arguing over Fallout 4, where one of them is trying to epically own the other through the power of editing. Good gameplay design, like Fallout. Horrible stories, like Fallout. And yet, apparently, neither of these people are It's a Gundam, but then I guess It's a Gundam adds himself into the edit as well to back up his friend in his friend's internet drama fight thing. I don't know who any of these people are. Bethesda games and their consequences have been a disaster for the human race. And you know what, at this point I'm too far down one rabbit hole to be interested in any others, so I'm just going to admit, I don't know what this drama is. And I think it probably doesn't matter, so let's ignore it. Skipping forward three minutes, It's a Gundam finally introduces the video, saying, This video is for those who have waited a prolonged period for me to speak upon a Reddit post, which was damning of Fallout or Bethesda, I should say, in general. I shall now do my best to represent this post in a fitting manner worthy of such work. But a flying nun wants to bring your attention to this video and breaks down just how bad it is and how it speaks volumes about how unqualified Elm is. If you've seen this video, great. If you haven't, then the author is about to break it down for you in many ways. The first problem... From here, It's a Gundam simply reads out the entire Reddit post word for word. This is strange because it means It's a Gundam must have read this entire Reddit post. I mean, we have proof he reads it, that's what the video is. Which means he must have read lines like... Of all emotions and feelings, I dare say email somehow found the most infantile. Like really, I'm asking seriously, can someone think of a less interesting human emotion feeling than suspicion? Even lust spawns dozens of trashy romance novels. Chris Avalon, for example, often writes about things he hates or things that depress him. I'm sure he's probably had a lot of sorrowful nights, and that makes me want to hug Avalon. Stabbing people. I worked on Thief 2. Holy fucking shit, Emel. How on earth is stabbing people any different from washing dishes? Stabbing people could have emotion and thought put into it, but we all know through experience with his writing that he didn't. Yep. There he goes. You can't say he hasn't read it. And yet, instead of thinking, huh, this seems a little strange or over-exaggerated or inaccurate, he instead thought, huh, this seems like something I want to read out again and upload on my YouTube channel. And so he did. This video got 187,000 views. And with the Reddit post and this video, the Emil hate train had officially left the station. Choo-choo, all aboard. Emil Pagliarello needs to get sacked if we ever want quality storylines ever again. If there was a petition to have this man fired, I would sign it so hard my keyboard would break. Rarely have I seen someone who is so clueless about his own lack of skill and then gets promoted to do the fucking job he's terrible at. Bethesda does not care what anyone has to say. They do not read Reddit posts, they totally ignore Twitter rants, they have never responded to mail or email, Emil just shrugs off criticism. Emil said in his conference that his philosophy was, keep it simple stupid. Well, I remember when Fallout was complex, interesting, and had a narrative about humanity, and that's never coming back. Basically, Emil thinks players are too stupid to appreciate good writing or any sort of depth slash substance so he keeps his core writing technique down to a very basic, very shallow, very low quality level. Keep it simple, stupid. Emil's philosophy for game writing on the grand level is keep it simple, stupid, to basically a terminal level. Famously, he gave a talk after Fallout 4 came out about how it wasn't worth making detailed main stories because players would just tear it out and make paper aeroplanes with it. 
did Emil really say that making story was pointless? If so, he probably shouldn't be in charge of story. It seems like there's an inherent conflict there. I always say half of Bethesda's problem is that lazy scumbag Emil. They would be much better without him. Seriously, he is not passionate in writing the stories. Emil Pagliarulo is a bad writer. His rules about writing games make very little sense and it seems baffling a professional games writer has those rules. Emil is terrible. Where's that video of him explaining his creative process and rules where he then contradicts himself and also never explains his thoughts and switches points midpoint endlessly? Emil has constantly failed up. Emil Pagliarello is a genuinely awful writer who thinks RPGs should have less dialogue because people won't read it anyway. And if you defend Emil, you're an idiot with bad opinions who should take a corporation's dick out of your mouth. Oh boy, I was hoping Emil wasn't the lead this time. I don't agree with all of the complaints about Fallout 4, but his response to the valid criticism of certain inconsistencies was basically, it's a video game, who cares? Not a great attitude to have leading your team. This goes on and on and on. It is but a small taste of an endless feast of bullshit. Compare search results of Emil's name before the Reddit post in February 2017 and in the years immediately after, and the difference is night and day. And again, it's not hard to understand why. As one Reddit user explains for us, I have no opinion on the guy, but I did some research just out of curiosity and found a post very similar to yours around a year ago, titled, Until Bethesda Fires Emil Pagliarello, Do Not Expect Quality Storylines Ever Again. And it's not a surprise that this is what they found, because this would have been the top result on Google after Wikipedia and Twitter. Hell, even today, it's still the second highest result, and that's after all of the Starfield discourse. For years and years, this one Reddit post was the place where every single person ended up when they heard Emil Pagliarillo and just wanted to know more out of curiosity or just wanted to do their research to have an informed opinion. And the more Emil's name was invoked, the more people ended up back here to learn who he was from a flying nun's Reddit post. And so, the more this post's ideas spread. But it's not only this Reddit post that was to blame, because as anyone who knows much about Bethesda games on the internet knows, wherever anti-Bethesda sentiment grows, YouTubers will always follow. A Flying Nun's Reddit post was hugely influential and entirely inaccurate. Luckily, however, the source material was still out there, so it should have only been a matter of time until someone came along and provided a better interpretation, or at least addressed some of the most common mistakes. And someone did come along, a self-styled Bethesda expert whose most popular videos focus on explaining why other YouTubers are wrong about their opinion on Fallout, and on Emil Pagliarillo himself. Well, great. Maybe an expert is just what this situation calls for. Kretosis has a long-running stream slash podcast where he focuses on criticizing other people's YouTube videos, which is great because that surely means he won't have any problem with me doing the same to one of his videos. I mean, this isn't personal. I'm just on a quest for truth and I could do with some expert opinion to help. Kretosis has produced nine hours of YouTube content about Emil Pagliarulo, eight hours of which are focused on this one 40-minute speech, which he talks about on stream with his friends, in his Fallout 4 analysis for one hour, and now in a standalone video. Now, eight hours sounds like a lot, so let's just focus on the standalone video, titled Breaking Down Emil Pagliarulo's Writing Speech. So, what did Kretosis think of the speech? Emil Pagliarillo, the lead writer for Bethesda and has been since Fallout 3, coincidentally around the time where their writing started taking a nosedive, a professional writer cannot even manage to keep himself on track in a speech he himself wrote and presented. His entire presentation is a meandering, rambling, disjointed mess, not so different from the stories he writes. 
He doesn't say anything of value for anyone interested in writing, and he never seems to make it around to any kind of point he's trying to make. Well, that sounds like an incredibly uncharitable take that rather sounds like it was influenced by a certain Reddit post, but I guess he's welcome to his opinion. Let's see what specific parts of the speech Cretosis had a problem with. He also wastes some time rambling about how his parents came to the city he's doing the speech in on a vacation, and how this country he's visiting is a place where games are made. I suppose he's trying to endear himself to the audience, but it's just not necessary. This is the very first piece of real criticism Cretosis presents, and I would like you to pay attention to how it's framed. Emil does praise the city where the conference is, Copenhagen, and says that he's always wanted to come here because his parents once went there on holiday, and when they returned it was the happiest he ever saw them. He then talks about and praises some of the games made in Denmark, which might be because this is a Danish games conference primarily focused on Danish video games. Now, I would describe this as just, you know, being nice and saying hello to the audience. Yet, Cretosis describes this as... He also wastes some time rambling about how his parents came to the city he's doing the speech in on a vacation, and how this country he's visiting is a place where games are made. I suppose he's trying to endear himself to the audience, but it's just not necessary. So, according to Cretosis, Emil is wasting time rambling, trying to endear himself to the audience, as if being nice is something bad and manipulative, and all of this is just not necessary. Well, thank God we have resident Emil expert Cretosis here to decode what Emil really means and to decide what is and isn't necessary to talk about at a Danish games conference. I mean, taking 30 seconds to acknowledge the contributions of Danish game developers? Unnecessary. Keep it on topic, i.e. Bethesda, and if any Danish game developer has a problem with that, tough. Get your own games conference. I mean, get another games conference. This one isn't about you. Oh, you think just because you make award-winning games like Inside and Hitman, that's enough for someone to acknowledge that you exist? No, absolutely not. The purpose of your entire country is to talk about Bethesda, and don't you guys ever forget that. <clears throat> Sorry, I think I got a bit carried away there again. Anyway, Cretosis' video is too long for me to show all of it, although feel free to watch it for yourself, it does do quite a good job at speaking for itself. Still, the important point I want to make clear to people is how Cretosis frames what Emil says as negatively as possible throughout the entire video and in every point Cretosis makes. For example, instead of saying things like Emil says, Cretosis will say Emil rambles to make the very act of speaking in a speech somehow seem like a sin. Here are some examples. I'm rambling about how his parents seemingly this is more of a rambling mess. He rambles a bit, he rambles more about the creation of Fallout 4, and it takes a lot of inane rambling to get to this point. There's more rambling, he pauses a lot, and there's also a lot of rambling and repetition here that I'm cutting out. He rambles about how every game developed rambles again. There's yet more rambling from ML. He rambles about not- Then he rambles about Skyrim's intro. He fucking rambles a lot. He rambles about how much of this- Yet even more rambling. The meandering, rambling, disjointed mess. I would like to point out that Cretosis' summary of Emil's speech is longer than Emil's speech, and if your summary is longer than the original, I don't think you can really criticize others for rambling. Still, a lot of this video is about Cretosis' opinions on the Elder Scrolls and Fallout. And those parts are fine, they are just his opinion on those games, and that is something he is perfectly entitled to. The other parts can be broadly categorized into three groups. The first is petty personal attacks against Emil. Anyways, back to the stupid speech. You'll notice when watching this that he didn't actually say anything of substance. He shows one of the most recognizable faces of anime and says people might not recognize him. I don't even need to comment on how fucking retreaded this is. I'm sorry, it's difficult for me to play my own stuff. Um... What a coincidence. I find it difficult to play your stuff too. Christ, you are fucking insufferable. Then there are parts where he either inadequately summarizes Emil, 
or takes things he says out of context to try to make Emil sound stupid or to just make the speech sound nonsensical. He rambles more about the creation of Fallout 4 in Boston, lists some places he knew, and even says he put his bedroom from when he was a kid into the game. Not sure what this has to do with story writing, but okay. This, by the way, relates to story writing because he's talking about drawing from personal experience in his writing, this time with growing up in Boston, and the part about his bedroom is just a light-hearted joke. Uh, Kretosis, if you're ever unsure how to identify jokes, a good way is to just listen to whether the audience laughs. Here's context. And that is where I grew up. Humble place, that's the street I grew up. And of course I had to put my bedroom in the game. <laughs> All right. There are more examples like this. He has said great games are played, not made like a dozen times in this section, some of which are in sentences that trail off and don't get completed as his mind moves on to something else. Making sure we remember that you are truly interacting with them, okay? This is the experience. We all, the player has a controller on their hand, and, and they can alter the narrative whenever they want. No, they can't! They literally cannot alter the narrative any time they want. What the actual fuck are you talking about, you clown? The context for this is Emil talking about the interactive nature of games as a medium. Hence, make sure to remember players can always alter the narrative whenever they want. Kretosis instead presents this as if Emil is making an absolute claim. These kinds of examples are tiresome and dishonest, but it can be hard to identify if these result from a failure of Kretosis's reading comprehension, leading to him genuinely misunderstanding, or if this is instead a deliberate attempt to purposefully misrepresent Emil to make him look as bad as possible. Regardless, the final type of example is similar, except it involves misrepresenting Emil's key points or writing rules so that Kretosis can make an argument against them to discredit them. Here is Kretosis on Keep It Simple Stupid. This is a pretty good phrase. I like it, as it applies to, well, just about everything. Except fucking story writing. As far as this phrase goes, it absolutely does not apply to story writing. In the creation of fiction, the more complex and detailed the world, events, and characters are, the better. Remember, Emil said he uses this rule in relation to themes, and that he thinks having a single strong central theme is good. Kretosis, on the other hand, is claiming that Emil applies this rule to all writing and all aspects of storytelling, and Emil claims all parts of stories should be as simple as possible, which is something that Emil has never said, and yet frequently appears in Reddit posts and YouTube comments. Kretosis then goes on to prove why this fake rule is bad. Good job, Kretosis. But the point I'm making is that not every story should be something simple, especially when you're dealing with a large open-world RPG with plenty of factions and decades of lore behind it. He does the same thing with the second rule, write what you know. He concludes that write what you know simply means draw from your personal experience, and it takes a lot of inane rambling to get to this point. This is also a point I very much disagree with. You can write good stories without direct first-hand knowledge or personal experience. You can be inspired by someone else's experience they're told to you, or that you hear of to write great things. So, Kretosis claims Emil's rule is only write about things you have first-hand experience with, and yet, in reality, all Emil said was, draw from your own experiences. He did not say they have to be first-hand, and in fact, the example he immediately gives is writing the Dark Brotherhood, an Assassin's Guild. And as far as I'm aware, Emil Pagliarello does not have any real-life experience of being in an Assassin's Guild. The final example is from the Paper Plane section that we heard earlier, which is probably the second most widely misinterpreted part of the original speech after Kiss. Here's Kretosis' response. This honestly just makes him look like a complete dickhead here, and this just comes across as an excuse for being lazy and writing a shit story. I have so many problems with this mentality. Just because someone is going to spend 200 hours building shacks doesn't mean they're never going to see the story, as evidenced by all the people who did see the fucking story. I like building shit in games that have that feature. I also want to enjoy a good story in Fallout 4, and got nothing. This is essentially saying that because side content exists that may distract players, 
They're gonna shit all over your story, which is monumentally fucking stupid. So, what Emil actually says is that when writing a story for a game, make sure to remember that players won't always do what you want them to, as they play their own way. And yet Kretosis presents this as if Emil is saying, don't bother writing a story at all, or don't try when writing a story, because players might not care about it. Which Emil quite clearly neither says nor implies. This comes across as someone with no understanding of how people play games is just completely out of touch with gaming. Maybe there will be some people who never touch the story, but to write it off as no one ever seeing your great American novel because they'll rip the pages out, make paper airplanes and build shacks, seems like the peak of ignorance. Peak of ignorance indeed. There are also a lot more personal attacks. No, it does not fucking sound great. Klingon promotion in the Brotherhood would be absolutely fucking nonsense. What are you talking about, you absolute fucking clown person? Well, no fucking shit, Sherlock. He then makes some nonsensical comparisons between games and movies. Killing this dumb bitch in Skyrim is not the Red Wedding. This is actually the perfect representation of how simplistic his understanding of everything is. This really speaks to his level of maturity. Ah yes, Emil is the one coming across as immature here, unlike the completely mature and not at all unhinged Kretosis. And talking of unhinged, I do think that's how Kretosis sounds at times. I assure you, the level of frustration I'm experiencing right now is immense. At one point, there even seems to be a call to action. The future of Fallout is fucking doomed if it remains in this man's control. Which does feel a little bit concerning, given just how openly Kretosis seems to hate Emil. And this is just one of several videos Kretosis has made about him. I'm not going to go over the others in the same detail, but I think it does need to be pointed out that this isn't a one-off. So here are a few representative clips from Kretosis' latest video, titled Bethesda's Emil Pagliarello is an Incompetent Writer. Let's check it out. Today I'm here to talk about a different problem, and that's the writing style of ML Pagliarello. ML is a fantastic example of someone who is promoted far beyond his skill or talent, as he's a hack writer, incapable of dealing with even the most basic and simple of plot lines. This man can't write for shit, and should not be in charge of writing jokes on bubblegum rappers. ML Pagliarello is absolutely an incompetent writer, and he should not be leading these projects. Even worse, this comes across entirely as though it's nothing more than a job to him, especially with Starfield. Rather than having any kind of passion or enthusiasm for the craft, I get the impression that he just does this because it's what he's paid to do. People who are passionate about their work, even if they're bad at it, don't turn in slop this fucking shallow and empty. We'll do better with ML gone. If a chef burns every meal he makes, he should be fired. If a surgeon loses every patient he has, he should be fired. If every story a writer makes is dog shit, they should be fired. I do wonder, what about YouTubers who make low quality videos that are full of misrepresentations, contradictions, and outright hate? What should happen to them? They should be fired. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. YouTubers are often allowed to say whatever they want, and usually they get away with it. This second video is arguably worse than the previous one, but it focuses more on events we haven't got to yet. Still, this second video is likely Kretosis' most successful video of all time, receiving over 240k views in just two weeks, meaning a lot of people have tuned in to listen to his expert analysis on the mind and writing of Emil Pagliarulo. This also means Kretosis is making decent money off of Emil's name. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe. Yeah, to be honest, I wasn't a fan. Now, I'm mostly focusing on three different Emil critics, and we've now covered two of them. Of the three, Kretosis is the worst. The final critic seems to have none of Kretosis' genuine hatred for Emil. Meanwhile, a flying nun shouldn't even be considered in the same category as these other two. They were just a disappointed fan 
who let their passion get the better of them a little bit when writing a Reddit post that unexpectedly blew up. I'm sure there was no real malicious intent behind it, which is not the case with Kretosis. One thing I particularly dislike about these videos is that Kretosis paints himself as the victim of the situation. And for years, if you had the audacity to say anything bad about these games, the amount of pushback and vitriol you got was insane. Yes, it's the internet and people will be shitheads about anything and everything, but many Bethesda fans go fucking rabid when you criticize their games. Well, I'm sure that must have been very hard for you to deal with. But you do say on multiple occasions how much you believe in criticism and how important and valuable you think it is. You even say as much in this video when complaining about Emil's apparent inability to take criticism. This kind of mentality is poison to creativity and self-improvement because it promotes the idea that criticism in and of itself is bad. And so, in that case, I guess you should be open to criticism of yourself, which is what I will admit I am doing right now. So I'm sure you'll appreciate my input. But if you don't, if you are sitting there right now listening to this, thinking about how much you hate me and how unfair this is, and how could a bigger YouTuber do something so cruel as to try to hold you to account for the things you've openly said? Well, consider this. Everything I've said has been based on the truth, and none of it has come from a place of hate. So think about how you're feeling right now, and imagine what it would be like to be criticized like this, except based on lies, where it's always hateful, and you see it every day from thousands of people. And remember, according to you, Emil is the one who can't handle criticism. So I guess this is your chance to show him how much better you can handle it. Somehow, I doubt this will be a turning point in your life where you develop genuine maturity, self-awareness and empathy. But I hope it is. It's never too late to grow as a person. And YouTube is a weird place. Making videos is weird. You spend many hours working on these things. You desperately want to give your audience what they want and make them happy. And you can start to lose perspective. And so you might start to see things like whether a video game is good or bad as this life or death situation where anything you say is justified. But it's not. So I hope you can find perspective. This wasn't personal. Good luck with content creation. Cretosis did not represent a monumental change in the nature of Emil Pagliarillo based discussion in the same way that a flying nun's reddit post did. In many ways, Cretosis was more of a symptom of Emil based sentiment than a cause. And I think it's only fair to point out that he was not the only Emil criticizer of this era. In fact, in a recent video titled Failure of Emil Pagliarillo, Starfield and Bethesda, long-running Bethesda-focused YouTuber Zarek Zacharon can be seen boasting about how he was critical of Emil before it was cool. And I'm kind of tired of bringing up Emil Pagliarulu at this point, although that's the point of the video, so we're going to be talking about him later. I just know that the internet is now, for the first time as a collective, waking up to the fact that he is bad at his job. The internet's just waking up to this fact, but for me it's old hat. It was until Emil himself went on camera for the story conference, and that talk was uploaded seven years ago. I almost immediately clipped the section where he discussed Kiss, Keep It Simple Stupid, and used as an Elgato Stream Deck button I could hit during live streams. Anytime the lackluster storytelling came up, I could just hit the button of Emil Pagliarulo revealing how much disdain he had for good storytelling in video games. My point here is that while most people are just now, this year, processing Emil Pagliarulo bad, I did that seven years ago. I'm over it. Yes, we have now got to the point where there are Emil hating hipsters who feel the need to let people know that they had the correct opinion before everyone else. For what it's worth, the impression I have of Zarek is generally quite positive. He is not someone who is just jumping on the Bethesda bad or Emil bad bandwagon for easy money and I even think he can provide interesting and original observations about Bethesda's games. In fact, I would even say that this video is a good example, despite how much I disagree with certain parts of it. That said, I do still think this video deserves to be mentioned. 
To me, one of the most telling things Eric says is actually towards the end. People want me to make a huge video hating on him and deconstructing the bad decisions he's made. But again, I've had seven years to process that he's a bad writer. So Zarek says people want him to make a huge video hating on Emil, which I expect is true. And YouTubers do tend to have a good idea of what their audience want from them. And yet it sounds a bit like Zarek's heart isn't quite in it, which is interesting. Other parts of his video do warrant criticism, however. And now there's a volume of unprecedented discontent being directed at Emil Pagliarulo. Oh, great. So Zarek realizes things might have went a little bit too far. Right. Which, considering he is the lead responsible for the game, is fair. Companies are not monoliths. Games are not created by faceless corporations. They have actual human creators. And those companies then ask you to buy and even evangelize their products. ML Pagliarulo is the progenitor of Starfield. He is the one most responsible. <sighs> Fuck. Well, Zarek isn't the only one with that opinion right now. We'll get to that later. For now, though, we need to identify what it actually was that turned the Emil hate mainstream. You might think the answer would be the obvious one, which is the release of Starfield. But if you go and actually check, you'll find out that it's not quite that simple, and that once more, the real catalyst seems to be a person. So, who's ready for Emil Critic number three? Starfield's reception was rocky, but this was hardly Bethesda's first rodeo. They had overcome fairly significant fan discontent with Fallout 4, and survived one of the most heavily criticized and controversial game launches in history with Fallout 76. But Starfield was their first new single-player game in a while, and fan expectations were high. Oh, and in case you still can't tell by this point, Bethesda fans and the community that surrounds them are quite a passionate bunch. Following Starfield's release, many fans were left disappointed. But there was a man that disappointment could be directed towards. And it wasn't Emil Pagliarulo. No, Emil is not the best known or most important developer at Bethesda Game Studios. That would be one Todd Howard a man who needs no introduction. Unless you don't follow the game industry very closely, in which case Todd is the executive producer at Bethesda and was the director for the majority of their best known games. He is also a man that features in many, many memes, and there's even an argument that could be made that he is the single most recognizable game developer in history. I mean, for example, there are more indexed search results on Google for Todd Howard than there are for Hideo Kojima, Shigeru Miyamoto, John Carmack, and Gabe Newell. Combined. This is probably because of meme magic, but Todd has been around doing interviews and acting as the face of Bethesda for over 20 years. This is the person it makes the most sense to blame for any disappointment over Starfield. And this is the person people did originally blame, quite a bit and yet never with the same intense hatred that would soon be directed at Emil. So, what changed? Well, if we go to Emil's Twitter, we can look at the responses to his tweets and see that they all seem to be positive, for months, until December the 9th, where Emil suddenly starts to receive a lot of criticism, eventually leading him to go on a mass blocking spree. And so, we have a timeline. On December the 7th, everything still seemed fine, and yet two days later, Emil is suddenly under heavy attack. And from this point onwards, every single tweet Emil makes will be filled with negative responses, despite the blocking, and many of which call for him to be fired. Now, there was another event on December the 13th, which we will get to, but we can clearly see that December the 13th wasn't the start. So something happened before then. Like, maybe 
an eight hour long YouTube video that has almost a million views in less than a month and talks about Emil Pagliarello constantly. This is Starfield Analysis, a quick retrospective by Patrician TV. Now, you might think eight hours, that's a lot of content to go through, but don't worry, there's really only one single part of it which matters. You could even call it a magic phrase. But why don't we let Patrician speak for himself? Diving into Starfield as a game requires three key words that are going to tie this entire analysis together. It's like a magic phrase that really explains everything wrong with this game. No design document. So, this entire eight hour analysis is tied together through these three words. And according to Patrician TV, these three words explain everything wrong with this game. Everything. Every single thing wrong with Starfield, according to Patrician TV in his own words, is explained by this. Now, this is a truly shocking revelation. The idea that any major game studio doesn't use any design documentation is almost unimaginable. They are such an integral part of game development and the idea that a game the size of Starfield could even be made without any documentation is almost unbelievable. But surely Patrician TV wouldn't just make something like this up, right? I mean, that would be a pretty bold lie to make, particularly when he says this is a magic phrase that ties the entire analysis together and explains everything wrong with this game. Magic indeed. But the thing about magic is that it isn't real. Although sleight of hand is. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But what is a design document? I'm sure some people are probably wondering. Well, really, it's a general catch-all term for any kind of document used during development. However, in the past, it was common practice to have one large central document to keep track of all of the most important information, which was called a GDD, a game design document. One really famous example of this that you can still check out online is the Doom Bible, the GDD from the 1993 game Doom. And so, using a single GDD was an industry standard in the 80s and 90s. Patrician TV, who based on what he says in this video, does not have any actual knowledge or understanding of game development, seems to believe using a single GDD is still standard practice. But it's not. For evidence, here is GameDeveloper.com's guide on how to write a game design document, which begins by saying, some clarification before diving in, number one, in bold, using a GDD is a thing of the past. Now, a more traditional GDD might still be used in pre-production as a sort of initial plan, but during development, most big studios will use some kind of wiki system instead, like Confluence. The most common term for these wikis is usually game developer wikis, but they're sometimes referred to as game studio wikis, internal wikis, dev wikis, or just the name of the actual software. The advantages of a wiki should be pretty obvious. Once upon a time, games only had 10 or 20 people working on them, and development would take less than a year so one document could do the job. But times change, and now big games have hundreds if not thousands of developers making a game over the course of many years, meaning a specialist wiki is a lot more practical than having one single big GDD. But again, Patrician TV doesn't seem to know any of this. And yet, that sure won't stop him from making a lot of assumptions about the lack of a GDD at Bethesda. We'll get to those assumptions soon. But first, we should probably try to work out where Patrician TV's claim even came from. I mean, he clearly doesn't know much about game dev, but that's certainly not a crime. He is just a YouTuber after all. Luckily, Patrician provides his source a few minutes later. Let's let him explain it. To be fair, design and writing director Emil Pagliarulo stated that there is a design document, but that it is very short and he believes the game itself is the real design document. 
Imagine being a designer and being told to go play the game instead of reading a few pages to answer your questions. This is woefully ineffective and can be chaotic on a development process. That's yeah, the good. design documents are only as good as, you know, it, it, the, your follow through when you actually start putting stuff in game, like, it, 100%. This is not the first time Pagli Rulo has discussed his aversion to design documents. In, in the development of the studio, we don't have a lot of extensive design documentation. We found that probably after we hit Fallout 3, the design docs that we had became outdated very quickly because we knew we needed to get stuff in the game and play it and then change it. We needed to iterate on it. So we would have these extensive 50-page design documents that were completely outdated and the time it took to maintain those just wasn't worth it. Okay, so in fact, there are three sources provided. Well then, let's go through them one by one before trying to find the real source. So, the first is a written quote from an audio interview conducted by Polygon. The question is, how did you keep yourself from going down rabbit holes as you built out the story and characters and things that were most important? Emil talks a bit about pre-production and then implementing initial ideas before saying they made a detailed timeline of events of the universe before we get to the part Patrician shows, which reads, It's not to say nothing is documented, everything is. So the main source Patrician TV will go on to use for the claim that nothing is documented at Bethesda starts by saying that everything is documented. And this is his best piece of evidence. Now, the funny thing is, in context, this is not proof that everything is documented, because this is not a question about everything or about design documentation. It's the final paragraph in a long answer about how they created the story for this big new universe. So when Emil says, everything is documented, from the context, we can only infer that this means that every part of the law and story is documented because that's what's being discussed. Emil then says that there is no giant design document containing everything, which is industry standard because modern games are too big for one single GDD to be practical. He then mentions two specific design documents they had for two in-game factions, saying these get updated by designers during production so the initial documentation becomes outdated. And the last line could support the idea of no documentation at Bethesda, but it more likely references something we'll get to shortly. Still, at least there is some ambiguity to this answer, and we have to remember that Patrician TV likely knows very little about game development, which surely makes it easier for him to accidentally misinterpret things. So we shouldn't be too harsh just yet, and there are two more sources. The second is a quote from a charity stream featuring several of the lead designers of Starfield. The question asked was what advice would you give to your younger self? And this is lead quest designer Will Shen's answer. Right, you know, play the game, play your content. Is it good or not, right? You know, trust your trust your instincts there. It's important to button things down and make sure that you actually covered all the corners. That's what the checklist is for. But it, the checklist isn't going to make your content good. You have to do that. That's yeah, the design documents are only as good as, you know, it, it, the, your follow through when you actually start putting stuff in game, like it, it, 100%. Now, Patrician TV presents this as Emil discussing his aversion to design documents. But in context, there is no evidence of any aversion to design documents. All Emil says is that a design document, i.e. your plan, is only as good as your follow through which is a completely uncontroversial statement. Emil is saying the end result is what's more important, and his enthusiasm isn't because of a dislike of design documents, but merely because he is agreeing with his co-worker's answer about the same subject. So, this proves nothing, other than that Patrician TV is willing to completely misrepresent the sources he provides by taking them out of context. But what about the third source? The classic from the speech that started this all, which Patrician again claims to be proof of Emil's personal aversion to design documents. Except, in context, this is one of the only parts of that whole 40-minute speech that is not about Emil's personal opinions, but is instead about the studio as a whole. Great games are played and not made. So this is a... 
This is a point for the studio. This is one of our mottos at the studio, but it has several meanings. Um, on a studio-wide level, great games are played, not made, means that we use the iterative process. So this is not proof of a personal aversion because Emil is not talking about his personal opinion. He does say that Bethesda moved away from using lots of extensive design documents after Fallout 3 in favor of a more iterative focused process, but this sounds more like an adherence to industry standards than a rejection of them. The era of one big central design document containing everything written before production starts ended long ago. In modern times, most large studios use a living document approach centered around some sort of wiki where various parts of game development can be documented in different ways according to different developers' needs and desires. And we have no reason to believe that Bethesda is any different. So, three sources that in no way prove that Bethesda doesn't use design documents, and in fact in many ways prove the exact opposite, and three sources that in no way prove that Emil himself has any aversion to design documents. Oh, and there will be even stronger evidence later, but we'll get to that. Also, keep in mind, this is all the evidence that exists online to draw any connection between Emil and design documents. This is a man that has done numerous interviews and speeches, year after year since Fallout 3 in 2008, always talking about various parts of these games, and from all of those countless interviews, this is everything that exists to characterize him the way Patrician TV is about to. One description of Bethesda's studio-wide approach, one agreement with his co-worker that the final product is what matters the most, and one brief mention of some story design documents used in creating Starfield's universe. Still, this all seemed rather strange to me, because at this point down the rabbit hole, I was starting to feel like the internet's foremost expert on things said about Emil Pagliarillo online, and for years, Emil received hate and criticism that had nothing to do with design documents. Unlike things like Keep It Simple Stupid or the Paper Aeroplanes, that were repeated constantly. And yet, there was one single example I remembered seeing before Patrician TV of someone attacking Emil over his neglect of design documents. And yes, it was someone we are already familiar with, resident Emil expert Cretosis, who criticized the design doc part of the original speech in the same way that he criticized every single thing about that speech including Emil's brief acknowledgement of the existence of Denmark. Yes, I guess I was wrong. Sorry, Kretosis, you were influential after all, because it seems like you might have influenced Patrician TV. Here's what Kretosis said. The design docs that we had became outdated very quickly. Funny that around the time their games started getting significantly worse is around the time they abandoned documentation. We would have these extensive 50-page design documents that were completely outdated, and the time it took to maintain those just wasn't worth it. Man, I don't know. Maybe if you had documented things properly, you wouldn't have so many issues in your games. This doesn't even have to be super, super professional, T's crossed and I's dotted type documentation. Just make sure you're taking notes on what you're doing so everyone else on the project knows what's being done and added to the game. I feel like if Fallout 4 had proper documentation, it would fix a significant chunk of their issues and would be far more coherent than it is now. Hmm, this does sound a lot like Patrician TV's interpretation. But could this just be a coincidence? I mean, Kretosis isn't a very big YouTuber, so how do we know Patrician TV actually saw this or even knows who he is? Well, in Patrician Skyrim analysis, he says that the best Skyrim video on YouTube is his podcast co-host video, but then he says... I would also rate Kretosis and G-Man Lives videos highly. So, Kretosis has one of only two Skyrim videos on the whole of YouTube that Patrician rates highly, showing that he does watch his content and that he thinks it's good. There's yet more rambling from ML. Well, to each their own. Maybe ML haters just like to stick together. Oh, and he's also admitted to watching Kretos' original Emil Speech Breakdown video on Discord and expresses familiarity with its content. But there is other evidence to support that this is where the idea came from as well. 
Patrician TV never mentions design documents like this in any of his videos pre Kretosis's mention of them, despite the fact that he clearly thinks they're hugely important now, and the fact that the original source has been around and criticised for seven years already, and the fact that Patrician had frequently talked about Emil before this. So, now that we have an idea of where the design doc attack might have originated from, I guess we should look at how Patrician TV uses it. After all, it is the magic phrase which ties all his analysis together and apparently explains everything wrong with Starfield. By account, Pagliarulo learns to hate design documents with Fallout 3, and so his next lead project of Fallout 4 went without one. So, we instantly jump to Emil learned to hate design documents, which there is zero evidence for, and a claim that this meant Fallout 4 didn't use one. Something that is obviously untrue, because even in the original source, Emil refers to Fallout 4 design documents. In fact, the game was not set there originally. I still have a design document in my desk, um, early on in pre-production, especially when you get to your own stuff. Everything's brilliant. Everything you do is brilliant. It's going to be great. Uh, you write your design documents, and then you play it in the game, and wow, it sucks. Let's keep going. Immel says the reason he dislikes design documents is because updating documentation is a time-consuming task, which is the ultimate ironic statement. For me, a central document is a huge time saver. Again, Emil has never said he dislikes design documents, and just because Patrician finds them to be a time saver for YouTube videos wouldn't prove anything anyway, as one person working on a YouTube video is not the same as hundreds working on a game for many years. Also, Patrician, no offence, but I don't think you can classify your document as a game design document unless it's for a game. Writing a plan in a Microsoft Word document doesn't make you special. There are too many examples like this for me to respond to each one, so let's just let Patrician speak for himself for a while. But, as is Bethesda tradition, if a good idea is broken, the best fix is removal. Take it out. Instead of figuring out how to better work with a design document, let's remove it. But perhaps the sequence was necessary in development to serve as a vertical slice of how all the mechanics were coming together, on account of there not being a design document, and for some reason they never decided to flag Crete as optional. The bizarre part though, where that lack of central design document comes in, is character creation. It makes sense being there was no design document to resolve which method players should ultimately be encouraged to use for multiple playthroughs. Rather, a well-documented timeline of events that define the history of the settled systems is something that should be written down in the design document and then referenced throughout the entire game. But that lack of a design document seems to be indicative that the quest designers were not exactly clear how much experience they should be rewarding for doing quests. This quest is different for sure, and you can probably guess why that is no design document. So it's not really surprising that Bethesda would not be keen on tackling a topic that a lot of science fiction either avoids or only pays lip service to, because this is absolutely the kind of thing you need a design document to tackle correctly. Maybe the person handling the recordings could have done a better job if they had some kind of resource documenting decisions made by designers, but I digress that they didn't know because there wasn't a central design document to help plan out the pacing of Starborn encounters to keep up with the player's own power escalation. Starfield's pitch did not include a clear outline of how these systems would cooperate with each other, and without a central design document and several distant teams working on different ideas, okay. So how does any of this work? The writers had to have a list of rules written down somewhere that, oh god, there was no design document because the writers don't really think about long-term consequences. And, well, you know why. Without a design document, most of the writers are only thinking in the immediate term. The lead quest design position at Bethesda is cursed, but I doubt it's because of any ghosts. It's a thankless and heavily criticized job, and I'm sure years of not having a design document and a mentality that everyone's idea is good, the only limitation is what's possible, war on the soul. So, there you go. Now, this is not every time Patrician invokes for lack of a design document to support his other arguments or claims, but it does give you a good taste of this video. And so, just as Patrician said, it is a magic phrase which explains everything wrong with the game and is used in all parts of his analysis. And through this, it is a way for him to pretend that his criticisms are some kind of objective truth 
and it's a way to continually ridicule Bethesda and Emil, who, remember, he puts all design doc related blame directly onto. And it's a way for Patrician TV to give his audience exactly what they want. People were disappointed with Starfield, and when people are disappointed, they want to know why this happened and who's to blame. And so, if a snake oil salesman comes along and claims to have insider knowledge, and then tells their audience exactly what they want to hear, the audience will probably buy it, not because they're dumb, but because that's a normal response. This is how things like scams, cons, and cults work. Lies are easy to believe as long as they say what people want to hear. And just like the original Reddit post, Patrician speaks with an authoritative voice, pretends to be an expert on the subject being discussed, gives lots of examples, and always speaks with complete confidence and conviction. But don't worry, guys, Patrician is on your side. In fact, he's doing this for you. But I don't think this video was unjustified. I think there were still enough people who felt betrayed by Starfield who want a voice to speak for them, to really hammer why this game didn't work. So there you go, he is the voice of the people, a true hero. And all it cost was the complete character assassination of one single innocent game developer. And by the way, it's not just over design documents that Patrician deliberately misrepresents and attacks Emil. Here are some other examples. Emil Pagliarillo has stated he does not listen to criticism. Ignoring the reviews. This is a common lie that creative people will tell. Note how Patrician doesn't say this as if it's his opinion, but instead as if he's just repeating Emil's own words, even though Emil has never said this, and he makes the same point more than once. And yet, despite the heavy criticism, the very first decision made regarding Starfield's design was not to have a silent protagonist. Because Emil doesn't listen to criticism. Ignoring the reviews. Years of Fallout 4 critiques all ignored because quality is equivalent to profit. Meaning I can say whatever I want and he probably won't hear about it. What a telling line at the end there. Meaning I can say whatever I want and he probably won't hear about it. Yes, sadly, that's true. But we'll get to it. I signed an NDA. I'm a professional. I don't want to get fired. Now sure, developers signing non-disclosure agreements is nothing new. But it's very clear that they muzzled Emil because even in the short controlled interviews he's allowed to do, almost everything he says is a damning indictment of Bethesda's design practices. Literally all you have to do is let him talk and he'll tell on himself the entire time. My ritual is to just go. I, I just like... I, I mean, I, I like stream of conscious. I think like I sometimes can be a little bit manic, but like. So NDAs are normal, except when Emil signs one, in which case it's quote, very clear that it's about muzzling him. And this is then followed by another out of context clip designed to make Emil look bad. Now, it's worth noting that Emil is not the only developer Patrician does this to. He's just the main one and the one I'm focusing on. You know there's a bunch of tourists surrounding Bethesda when they're sad that Pete Hines retired. No, good, I'm glad he's gone. I would also like to point out that the vast majority of the clips I have shown you from Patrician's video came from the first two hours, because that's how much I watched before deciding that I have far too many examples already to fit in, and that there is just no way anything in the rest of the video could ever redeem it. So I am not cherry picking the worst examples from this eight hour video. I don't need to. I am cherry picking the worst examples from the first two hours of it. And there are a lot of strong examples that didn't make the cut, particularly around non-design document related insights. This style of using original sources only to misrepresent them or to make completely unfounded assumptions based off them or to take them out of context or to just attack the developer involved, is a constant feature in Patrician's style of analysis. In fact, at one point, Patrician takes his assumptions so far that he says something quite strange. Let's revisit an old quote. By account, Pagliarulo learns to hate design documents with Fallout 3, and so his next lead project of Fallout 4 went without one. I think if you were to ask him, he'd probably liken the process to jazz music. Okay. So ignoring the fact that Emil hating design docs is fake and Fallout 4 not using a design doc is fake, 
Why on earth does Patrician TV think that Emil would liken the process to jazz music? Because I have never heard Emil mention jazz, he doesn't mention it in any of Patrician's sources, I can't find any connection between Emil's name and jazz on Google, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone else make this comparison either. So why would Patrician say that this is what Emil would say? Where does this assumption even come from, and why does he think it's necessary? Because he could have said, Emil's process seems a lot like improvisation in jazz music, except while this might work in jazz due to the small group size, this doesn't work in something with a large amount of people collaborating, like game development. And that would be fine. That is a greatly shortened version of the point Patrician goes on to make, and that point, in isolation, is alright. So what's the benefit of making this metaphor? Patrician's metaphor, and a decent enough metaphor at that, have to come from Emil's mouth instead of his. Relative to other things I'm mentioning here, this is very minor, and Patrician does qualify this assumption with both I think and probably. So this isn't misleading in the same way that many of his other claims are. But it is strange. And it really makes me wonder if making completely unfounded assumptions about developers and parts of development has become so normalised to Patrician that it doesn't even seem weird to him to make his words come from Emil's mouth even at times when it's completely unnecessary. I'm going to try to be charitable here for a second. Patrician clearly believes in the value of referencing outside source material in game analysis. Now, personally, I think the best arguments about a game should be supported through evidence that comes exclusively from the game itself and your experience with it. But this is something people might have different opinions about, and that's fine. There should be different approaches to game criticism, and different audiences might enjoy different styles. And so, Patrician seems to have focused on this one thing he genuinely felt was important. External sources. And he was successful doing this, gaining plenty of views and fans. And so, as he continued to make videos, this became a bigger and bigger part of them. Not for malicious reasons, but because he wanted to make good content. And it was his opinion that this approach was what made him better than the other YouTubers who only talk about their opinions something he discusses in the intro to his Skyrim video. Now, what would happen if I did not do that? If I took the common road of simply preaching with an authoritative voice? In that instance, then I would simply dictate my perspective on fast travel as though it were the one correct opinion to have, and then move on. It is true that many would be both entertained and convinced simply with a deep voice and an air of charisma. Insert profile pictures of relevant YouTubers here. However, I don't look at my audience as people to be tricked into liking my work with techniques of propaganda. If you want videos that simply preach opinions as the only true perspective to have, then dozens of videos that are both pro and against Skyrim already exist to validate your existing opinions. When you realize that over 80% of those videos have nothing to say, I'll still be here, keeping my gate open for you. And so, Patrician truly believed in this approach and leant into it. And the end result of this ever higher and higher emphasis on outside sources that were still ultimately just being used to support his subjective opinions about the game was this Starfield analysis. Where the central thesis is that everything bad in Starfield is because of no design documents and that this observation, uniquely made by him, the higher tier game critic, is something that can magically explain everything people dislike. And, yes, I am aware of the irony of him referring to other people's YouTube videos as using techniques of propaganda. I was choosing to let it slide. But despite all this, I do think it's only fair to say that what is seen in his Starfield video does seem to be the end result of this approach. I will admit I have not watched much of his other content relative to its length, but from what I've checked, in his other videos, he doesn't seem to present original source material in the same misrepresented way, and while he does make bold reaching assumptions based on these sources and attack game developers at times, at least he doesn't outright lie. That aspect seems to be unique to his Starfield video. And just so we're clear, 
This absolutely is a lie. It is a lie that Bethesda doesn't use design documents. Just like it's a lie that Emil hates design documents. Just like it's a lie that Fallout 4 was made entirely without design documents. Just like it's a lie that this is a... A magic phrase that really explains everything wrong with this game. No design document. Patrician TV will defend this by saying that because he says one time in an eight hour video that... Design and writing director Emil Pagliarulo stated that there is a design document, but that it is very short and he believes the game itself is the real design document. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but that is not how the truth works. Truth is not a one and done type concept. If you tell the truth once, and then lie over 30 times, you're still a liar. And on top of that, even the one time when you do tell the truth still involves lying. Emil doesn't mention a central design doc at all, and at no point does he say it's very short. What he actually says in your quote is almost the opposite, that there isn't a giant design doc including everything, but that everything is still documented. So even in your example of telling the truth that I guess you thought would shield you from any and all criticism, what you say still isn't even true. Patrician TV will continue to defend this by saying it's just a meme, and if anyone misrepresents it, that's their fault. But again, sorry, but saying it's a meme doesn't justify it. If anything, it makes it worse because it means that you knew this phrase that you repeated so many times would be picked up by your fan base, allowing it to spread even further, that's what memes do, and that's exactly what it did. And so, you knew you were lying, and you knew the lie would spread, and I think we can probably assume that you knew this would seriously hurt the reputation of the developer the lie is about. And this also needs to be recognized. YouTubers, do make mistakes, and YouTubers do make factual errors. But there is a difference between a YouTuber getting something wrong by accident and deliberately crafting a lie designed to hurt and discredit someone who hasn't even done anything to them other than being involved in the development of a game they dislike. We don't need to hold YouTubers to the highest possible standards of reporting, but surely there should be at least some standards about what a YouTuber can and can't say in order to get views and money and satisfy their personal grudge against a game developer. Of course, Patrician TV tries to use the same blame-avoiding tactic over criticizing Emil by saying this. I don't feel like clarifying every single time I say his name that I think Todd Howard could have pushed back against Emil's impulses or trying to guess where the line between Emil Pagliarulo and Will Shin was, just bear in mind moving forward that Starfield's problems are not to blame on one single person. By account, Pagliarulo learned to hate design documents with Fallout 3, and so his next lead project of Fallout 4 went without one. By the way, this clip looks like I edited together two different parts to use irony to emphasize my point, but I didn't. That's actually how his video goes. Just bear in mind moving forward that Starfield's problems are not to blame on one single person. By account, Pagliarulo learned to hate design documents with Fallout 3, and so his next lead project of Fallout 4 went without one. A magic phrase that really explains everything wrong with this game. No design document. Now, that is me editing two clips together to show the irony of the original statement. You cannot say I'm not blaming one person one single time before spending hours and hours blaming one single person where the blame is baked into your central thesis. That's not how this works. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm overreacting and no one blamed Emil or got the wrong impression. Well, let's look at the top comments to find out. Quote, and this one's at the very top. It warms my heart to see rage against Emil hands down the worst writer I've had to suffer through. Hearing Emil say they essentially scrapped design documents after Fallout 3 makes everything they've done since make so much more sense. Listening to Emil makes me wonder how many antidepressants must be consumed by his team. 
He sounds like the worst type of boss. He gives vague directions, blames everyone else when those directions fail, and then takes credit for what works. This comment goes on for a while, by the way, calling Emil a petulant man-child and saying Emil having a job is proof Bethesda doesn't value their employees' mental health. And it continues. Emil's entire shtick about not using design documents earns his reputation in spades. Another title of this video can definitely be Why Design Documents Are Important, because this was a damn good thesis. Emil is the textbook definition of failing upwards. It's actually insane how obviously incompetent he is. There are almost 6,000 comments as of me writing this, and about half of the top ones are about Emil or design documents or both. But this is just one video. Well then, how did other places react? Here's Reddit straight after this video went up. Quote, Let Emil go do something else, and for the love of God, use a goddamn design document. That's in caps lock, so I guess I was meant to shout. I'm not gonna shout. No guiding design document at Bethesda. What a genius move when you have 400 plus employees. Let's just wing it. Nothing bad can come out of that, right? So no, no, I really don't agree with Emil's design process. Or, the absolute lack of care and laziness to not have any core design document is something you'd expect from an intern, not a seasoned veteran like Emil. Or, no, a lack of design documents is directly responsible for the design failure that was Starfield. Emil is an idiot. There are so, so, so many examples like this. And all of them, of course, were posted directly after Patrician TV's video. And not even just in the normal Bethesda focused subreddits. Friendly reminder that Emil Pagliarello went on record saying that Starfield did not have a design document. Design documents are the literal foundation of game design. Emil Pagliarello is the man to blame for writing in Bethesda games. He is the one who is against design documents in Bethesda. Emil Pagliarello deemed Starfield not to need a design document. He claimed in a talk that design documents were a waste of time. That coupled with him whining about it afterwards really speaks to his ego. On and on and on. Design document, design document, design document, design document, design document, design document, design document. And every single time these people say this, they will be citing this video or citing someone else that originally cited this video. And of course, where anti-Bethesda sentiment grows, YouTubers will always follow. We can only assume what we are told is true, which is Emil Pagliarulo proudly presents us with Starfield. Proudly. Proud of the fact that he did not use a central design document. Proud of the fact that everyone kind of does their thing in a bubble. Proud of the storytelling that they have made for it. Who else are we to look at? and judge. During a speech he did, Emil Pagliarillo had explained that there's little to no internal documentation during development of their games. It is very likely that this lack of documentation is the reason why Bethesda completely flip-flops on issues, like whether ghouls need food and water in Fallout, given the fact that Emil himself says they don't do game design documents. I need to stress this point. These documents are what keeps the team in line and on track for the most part. It's essentially a vision of what the final product should look like, rather than just letting people do whatever the fuck they want. It's like the equivalent of not having blueprints when building a fucking skyscraper. But it might have something to do with not having a lore master, not having design documents, and not being beholden to something someone wrote 20 years ago. In fact, a small YouTuber named Blaze even made two standalone videos on it and these ended up being the first videos on his channel to take off. I wonder who inspired Blaze. So Patrician TV just put out their most recent video, which is a quote unquote, quick review of Starfield. But as of the time of this recording, I literally could not have finished that video, but there's a reason why I decided to stop and make this video now. And that's because Right at the beginning of that video, he talks about something, or rather, he reveals something about Bethesda's development strategy that is so mind-bogglingly, just astonishingly stupid. It is the fact 
that according to Emil, one of the highest higher-ups at Bethesda, that they don't use a design document when making their games. Well, this section took a while, but at least we've come to the end of the Patrician TV part of this video and can now move on. Why don't we at least let him say his closing line though, after talking about his video for so long? It's only fair, I guess. And that's why I find a sense of finality with this project. A sense of poetic closure. There is not an image smug enough to portray how vindicated I feel at years of Bethesda fans denying what I had to say and being rewarded with this game. Starfield is absolutely the game that you deserve. Well, that's a nice final line, I suppose. Very punchy. Good delivery. But it does sound a little bit familiar to me. I mean, it kind of sounds like something I might write. In fact, it kind of sounds like something I did write. But if you are someone who only prays the Outer Worlds because that praise fits nicely into your Bethesda-dominated worldview, then I just want you to know that the Outer Worlds is exactly the game you deserve. It's nice seeing your old videos, because it reminds you how far you've come. Although, I don't understand why my voice always sounds so different every video. Anyway, that's a very strange coincidence, seeing as it's the same final line and about the same subject, Bethesda. But for all I know, Patrician TV doesn't even watch my content. YouTube is a big place. Except, it seems that there's almost 12 hours of him watching and talking about my videos on stream. Huh. But why would he even be watching a video on the Outer Worlds? No one cares about the Outer Worlds in 2023. Oh, he just made a video on the Outer Worlds before covering Starfield. Okay, probably not a coincidence then, but it is just one line. I wouldn't want to invoke everyone's new favourite P-word, over something as small as that. I will say though, that I have only watched about two or three hours of Patrician's content, and I can only recognize things that are copied from my writing, because I can only remember my own stuff, and I'm not even sure if I can remember all of that. So it is strange to find something like this, because if I found one thing in two hours, then if you were to check all of the many hours and against the writing of all YouTubers, then that's statistically not the most promising thought. I mean, I'm not saying don't trust, I'm just saying maybe also verify. Because I heard recently that people who borrow one thing sometimes borrow more. Well, they do say imitation is the highest form of flattery. Which is not true, but it is what they say. So thanks, I guess. I didn't know you were such a big fan of mine. Speaking of which, what did you have to say about me? You're a cuck. You're a fucking cuck. Not only are you a cuck, you're like fat bastard cuck. Oh, I guess he doesn't like me. Anyway, I'm mostly bringing this up just to acknowledge it. It seems Patrician TV is not a fan of mine, and I'm not really sure why. I've never interacted with him, so this is a one-sided relationship. Until now, I guess. That said, it is a shame, because I feel this undermines my video a little bit by making it seem like this is in some way personal, when it's not. This video is something that needed to be made, regardless of who it did or didn't feature. So let's get back to the real topic, and let me remind you where we're up to. Patrician TV makes a video saying that everything wrong with Starfield is because of the lack of a design document, and that Emil is the one directly responsible for this. This idea quickly spreads amidst the community who were just waiting to be told who was really responsible for the failures of Starfield. Emil then begins getting attacked on Twitter, leading to a blocking spree, but the criticism keeps coming. So imagine you are Emil Pagliarulo in this situation. What would you do? Now, keep in mind, Emil won't have watched any 8-hour video on YouTube because he's a boomer with a family and a job, and he's probably not interested in consuming hours and hours of Bethesda hate content. And so, imagine you're Emil, and you suddenly notice people are criticizing you on Twitter. And if you've Googled your name, you'll see it's even worse on Reddit. And not only that, 
but a lot of these people seem to be making assumptions about what happened during the development of Starfield. Blaming you for things you didn't do, putting words in your mouth that you never said, and asking for you to be fired or to leave Bethesda. So, what would you do? If people were repeatedly accusing me of things I hadn't done, I'd respond. Emil might disagree, however. Yeah. Uh, you. Yeah. Uh, how do you handle criticism of big video? You cry. Do you ever take a question? What? How do you handle? Cri I'll tell you the one. The way you handle criticism. You never engage with the assholes. Never, never. Don't give them any. Like everyone is t is entitled to their opinion, right? Like, and we realized, like, so with as we started getting bigger, right? Like, we realized there was this weird sort of cumulative effect with everything. When you ship 30 million copies, well, one percent of 30 million, a lot of people are going to see it, right? And so. If one percent doesn't don't of people don't like something, one percent thirty million one percent of thirty million that's a lot of people, you know. So there are a lot of detractors, and so everyone has their opinion, um, you, and you don't engage them. You don't have Twitter meltdowns, you know. You just sort of you take the feedback in. Some of it is valid, some of it's not, and you just have to be an adult, stay calm, and sort of you know try to ask yourself, is this guy right or is he wrong? Is, is she right or is she wrong? What, what are they saying about me? And so you try to pick out the negativity and, and take the valuable information. And yes, you do take a personal <laughs> So Emil believes don't engage no matter what. Let people talk about whatever they want and just accept that this is part of being a game developer for a popular series. And yet, on December the 13th, six days after Patrician TV Starfield analysis went live, Emil broke his cardinal rule, and had a bit of a Twitter meltdown. Quote, One out of fifteen. Funny how disconnected some players are from the realities of game development, and yet they speak with complete authority. I mean, I can guess what it takes to make a hostess Twinkie, but I don't work in the factory, so what the hell do I really know? Not a lot. End quote. God damn it, Emil. If you didn't make that Twinkie analogy, things may have went so much better for you. But is he wrong? Some players are disconnected from the realities of game development, and yet they do speak with complete authority, and some of them even have a massive platform. So, is Emil wrong? Let's continue. I am going to shorten this a bit where I can, but the full version is on screen and in the source list below. Quote, Part of me really gets it. When you're a consumer and you spend money on things, that gives you the right to complain about those things. And there was a time I exercised that right very freely. When I was writing game reviews for Adrenaline Vault forever ago, I was absolutely the person who would say whatever I wanted about a game, good or bad. But throughout that time, I actually had no inkling what game development was like. How hard the designers, programmers, artists, producers, and everyone else worked the struggle to bring a vision to life with constantly shifting resources, the stress. I'm not trying to change anyone's mind, but given my position, I can't not share the truth. And that truth is, nobody sets out to make a bad game, and most game devs are incredibly talented, even if the game they release isn't up to par. So sure, you can dislike parts of a game, you can hate on a game entirely, but don't fool yourself into thinking you know why it is the way it is or how it got to be that way. Chances are, unless you've made a game yourself, you don't know who made certain decisions, who did specific work, how many people were actually available to do that work, any time challenges faced, or how often you had to overcome technology itself. So yes, love games, buy them, play them, and complain to your heart's content. It's sort of the nature of a developer-player transactional relationship. But just know, but the game you're playing is in some ways a freaking miracle in and of itself. Normal people have come together to work for years for one goal, to bring you fun and happiness. So it helps to remember that, and them. Boomer emoji, heart emoji. So, 
which part is incorrect. Now, obviously, in its entirety, it's not a good look. For one thing, it's too long. For another, it's too positive, which feels like a bit of a failure to read the room that at the time was largely negative. And lastly, it's not specific enough, which allows room for misinterpretations and doesn't highlight the important parts well enough. But the crux of the argument is that it's okay for anyone to criticize or hate a game, yet that doesn't mean you understand why the game is the way it is or what happened during its development. This is true, and the consequences of what happens when people just assume things and pretend knowledge they don't have has hopefully been shown already. And given how regularly Emil had been criticized based on untrue statements and inaccurate representations for seven years, it's quite easy to see where he's coming from and why he thought this was necessary to say after Emil Haidt saw a major resurgence. But most people don't know most of this story. So let's see how people reacted. Like the most viewed reaction titled Starfield Dev Blames the Players. So there is an individual that works at Bethesda. Well, what the hell do I really care? Not a lot. You think I give a fuck about your problems as a game developer? You brought out a game that didn't even have a fucking map for a city. Jesus. So pathetic. I swear to God, some game developers... There's like this, this fucking uh, strain of game developers that are like in this constant battle to be uh, like recognized for having a hard job. It's like streamers that are like fixated around people feeling sorry for them for being streamers. Shut the fuck up. If you don't like it, get another job. Nobody gives a fuck about your problems. Nobody cares about how you feel. It doesn't matter and it never did and it never will. Well, maybe one day people will care. I mean, I can dream. I'm not sure if Asmongold was having a bad day that day, or if he feels this is a normal response. But while most reporting of Emil's tweets were far less vitriolic than this, Asmongold was still the one who truly reflected the views of the Starfield player base. And so, the Emil hate marched ever onwards and to ever greater heights. I would also like it to be known to the jury that despite there being no mention of design documents in Asmongold's video, there certainly is in the comments. Funny how that criticism always seems to show up now anytime Emil's name is mentioned online. After this tweet thread, Emil replied to many people on Twitter, always politely, and one reply in particular came to be used a lot by his detractors to further attack him. It reads, Oh, the Reddit thread? Lol, yeah, every so often someone likes to dig up a talk I did years ago and misrepresent what I said. Apparently I also don't care about Fallout lore, can't write to save my life, and have the IQ of a peanut. It's on the internet, so it must be true. Still, for the most part, Emil's Twitter is a place of positivity. He tweets regularly, usually at least once a day, and so on December the 14th, one day after being roasted mercilessly by the entire internet, he tweeted, this. The one thing I never wanted was for my Twitter feed to become mired in negativity. What was intended to be support and respect for game devs and the development process has morphed into something else entirely. Lesson learned. It's the holidays, spread some cheer. This is a stereotypical Emil tweet. He seems to be a positive person. Most tweets are about the games he's been playing or the movies he's been watching. He regularly compliments other game developers' work on all sorts of different games. He talks about his wife, he talks about his family, he posts recipes of 18th century cookies that he baked, and so on. He also comes off as kind of goofy, maybe too openly into nerd culture in a way that seems uncool, and too positive in a way that feels out of place on a website usually so infused with cynicism and irony. I would say he seems like a well-meaning and slightly out-of-touch boomer and I don't mean that negatively. He's not always positive, though. A few weeks before he was attacked for being an entitled game developer, he tweeted about how much he's been struggling with grief after his sister unexpectedly died of cancer. This is a normal person. Now, I don't know Emil Pagliarulo, 
and so I can only judge him based on the things he has said and wrote online. The thing is, that's also true for everyone else. Maybe he's not a good person. There is no way to know for sure just by looking in from the outside. But just as I do not truly know this, that's the same for everyone else. We can only judge the evidence that is available. And within that evidence, there is nothing here or anywhere else I have seen to suggest that this man is in any way deserving of hate. And I have looked for evidence. When I began this video, I fully expected to see some examples of elitism or antagonism or petty arguments or things that seemed egotistical from Emil. And often, when people develop a negative reputation online, they do play at least some part in creating it. I also believe that there are two sides to every story, so I wanted to find the other side of this one. But it doesn't seem to be there. Probably because Emil doesn't believe in responding to negativity online. And I have to wonder if that's part of what caused this situation. For years, people have been able to say anything they like about Emil without ever having to worry about any repercussions. And one good example of that is Patrician TV, who knowingly lied in his video, knowingly encouraged his fans to harass Emil, and has continued to try to goad Emil into responding directly to him ever since. So far, this has not worked. But eventually, Emil did make an interesting tweet. You see, after accidentally making a reference to design documents he was working on, the same design documents that apparently do not and have never existed, Emil finally seemed to realize that the interview he had done with Polygon was being used as evidence for the now widespread belief that Bethesda doesn't use design documents. And so he replied with a normal Emil tweet, still seeming completely oblivious of the significance of the design doc discourse and saying that, of course they used design documents and that he didn't know that was something he needed to specify. So, in case you needed any further proof that Patrician TV lied, based his entire 8-hour analysis on a lie, deliberately spread this lie, and continues to lie to this day. And why not? Emil doesn't respond to negativity, and the one time he did try to, it made everything worse. And so, people like Kretosis, and Patrician TV, and others, have had complete freedom to say whatever they like about him without ever having to even consider any consequences, because people have been saying whatever they want about Emil for seven years. And the idea that someone with a platform would actually take an interest in the topic, and then go out of their way to cover something that to most people is insignificant, while risking their reputation by going against everyone else and defending someone everyone hates. Well, the idea of someone doing that is almost unimaginable. There is one thing I haven't mentioned in this video yet, and that is Emil Pagliarulo's writing which is at the centre of many of the older accusations that have been made against him. For what it's worth, no one outside Bethesda knows exactly what Emil did or didn't write, but some things we do know he wrote some of or was heavily involved in include The Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion, The Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim, Nick Valentine in Fallout 4, the main stories in Fallout 3 and 4, and many design concepts for Starfield. But these games are made by many people, and writing in games of this scale is a collaborative process. No one knows what Emil did or didn't write, and frankly, I do not think it matters. Personally, I am not at all convinced he is a bad writer, but I don't truly know. None of us do. It's all speculation, based on things we only have a tiny amount of information about, and yet apparently, we're confident enough to not only declare this person to be bad at their job, but also to try to punish them for this crime. And what if he was a bad writer? Well, for one thing, he might be good at his job in other ways. He might be an enjoyable person to work with, or good at looking out for his team, or good at managing people, and so on. But 
even if we ignore all that, in what way are we responsible for punishing people who are bad at their job? What is the punishment, by the way? Hate? Being fired? Some kind of long-term psychological trauma, maybe? And who gets to decide who is bad? Oh, and does this also apply to all jobs, or is this video game specific, or writer specific? And where the fuck does our authority come from? We are not a judge, we're not a jury, we're not any kind of personification of justice. We are an angry mob attacking a man we know next to nothing about because we thought a video game they made was bad. I wish we were just, though. In a court of law, both sides get to present an argument, and people are presumed innocent until proven guilty. On the internet, that isn't usually the case. One side often drowns the other out, if the other side even gets presented at all, and people are declared guilty long before and independent of if anything's been proven. And sometimes, majority rule gets things right. But sometimes, it doesn't. It is worth keeping in mind, however, that this video is only arguing for one side. Although, I have done my best to be both factual and fair, and if you have any doubts, the sources are below for you to check. Still, this does not mean this is a situation where the other side has not been given a voice. The case against Emil Pagliarulo has been shouted by thousands and thousands of people, some with big platforms, again and again, year after year. And I am not trying to hide the other side's argument. I am trying to do the exact opposite. It's also worth keeping in mind that I absolutely do have an incentive here. I'll admit it. I want people to stop trying to get this man fired for things he has not done and for words he has not said. And I also want YouTubers to think more carefully about what information they present and where they get that information from. And I want YouTube viewers to do more to protect themselves from misinformation and not believe everything you hear online so easily, especially when that information tells you what you want to hear, because those are the times you're vulnerable. Many other people in this story also have motive. There is a clear financial incentive to make Bethesda bad videos. They are some of the best performing in the YouTube gaming space, and this can be seen quite clearly just by comparing these videos to others by the same creators. And as for the other people in this video, what they do is up to them. But the correct thing to do in this situation is to say sorry to the person you've harmed. Mistakes happen. YouTubers get things wrong. YouTubers get carried away. YouTubers lose perspective. Sometimes everyone fucks up. But the correct thing to do in those situations is to own up to it, apologize, and move on. And I'm not saying doing the right thing is easy. I'm just making it clear what the right thing is in this situation. Oh, and by the way, Patrician TV. You like research, so some advice. It might be worth researching something called defamation because the case against you seems rather strong and almost everything that's usually so hard to prove, you have provided evidence of already. The sad thing about this situation is that I don't think something like that would ever actually happen because as far as I can tell, Emil Pagliarulo is just not that kind of guy. He has never shown the slightest interest in internet drama and seems to only want to spread positivity and make games. The idea that this guy would ever sue anyone just seems so hard to believe, even if he would win, and even if they deserved it. And that's what I find so upsetting about these events. All of this didn't seem to happen in spite of the kind of person Emil is. It happened because of it. And remember, this is all over a video game. Every single thing that happened here was because people played a game and found it disappointing. And then, instead of just, you know, moving on and maybe playing a game they do like, they instead needed someone to blame, someone to hate, someone to frame, 
someone to attack because of a video game. Good job, everyone. Thank you for watching. ML is a fantastic example of someone who is promoted far beyond his skill or talent, as he's a hack writer, incapable of dealing with even the most basic and simple of plot lines. His entire presentation is a meandering, rambling, disjointed mess. This is actually the perfect representation of how simplistic his understanding of everything is. Christ, you are fucking insufferable. I assure you, the level of frustration I'm experiencing right now is immense. If every story a writer makes is dog shit, they should be fired. Diving into Starfield as a game requires three key words that are going to tie this entire analysis together. It's like a magic phrase that really explains everything wrong with this game. No design document. By account, Pagliarulo learned to hate design documents with Fallout 3, and so his next lead project of Fallout 4 went without one. Emil Pagliarulo has stated he does not listen to criticism. This is a common lie that creative people will tell, and you can probably guess why that is. No design document. Because this is absolutely the kind of thing you need a design document to tackle correctly. Oh god, there was no design document. But I don't think this video was unjustified. We can only assume what we are told is true, which is Emil Pagliarulo proudly presents us with Starfield. Proudly. Proud of the fact that he did not use a central design document. Proud of the fact that everyone kind of does their thing in a bubble. Proud of the storytelling that they have made for it. Who else are we to look at and judge? Given the fact that ML himself says they don't do game design documents, not having design documents, and not being beholden to something someone wrote 20 years ago. So there is an individual that works at Bethesda. Nobody gives a fuck about your problems. Nobody cares about how you feel. It doesn't matter, and it never did, and it never will. Jesus. So pathetic. I swear to God, some game developers... There's like this, this fucking uh, strain of game developers that are like in this constant battle to be uh, like recognized for having a hard job. Shut the fuck up. If you don't like it, get another job. And so everyone has their opinion. Um, you, and you don't engage them, you don't have the Twitter meltdowns. You know, you just sort of, you take the feedback in. Some of it is valid, some of it's not. And you just have to be an adult, stay calm, and sort of, you know, try to ask yourself, is this guy right or is he wrong? Is, is she right or is she wrong? What, what are they saying about me? And so you try to pick out the negativity and, and take the valuable information. And yes, you do take a personal <laughs> Yeah.